we'll start. Um, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon for this webinar. Um, my name is Nicholas Searles. I work at our Bicycle Network in the Public Affairs team as the media advisor. Uh, today, uh, well, welcome to our webinar. Um, today we're gonna be, uh, the webinar, the title of the webinar is uh, Know Your Rights on the Road, Dealing with Conflict. And today we're gonna be talking about exactly that, dealing with conflict when you're out riding your bike amongst other road users. Uh, firstly, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, which we all gather in our various homes and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd also like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about dealing with conflict when out riding your, your bike amongst other road users, both from a legal perspective, as well as a psychological perspective. Now, um, some of you or most of you joining us today may be aware of a certain incident uh, involving a group of riders in Melbourne last month that um, turned quite ugly and, and made headlines, um, which has prompted uh, this webinar for us to sort of continue the discussion. And we're actually lucky enough to have one of the riders involved, Lee Turner, with us today. Um, we'll be referring back to Lee's in to the incident that Lee was involved in throughout the webinar, and as well as um, giving Lee an opportunity to, uh, to answer any questions uh, around the incident he was involved in. Um, as well as Lee, we also have uh, a number of other speakers joining us today. We have uh, Dimi from Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Uh, Dimi's represented hundreds of uh, road accident clients who have lodged compensation claims with the TAC, and she'll be running through some of um, some of the laws around road safety and specifically around overtaking cycles by bicycles when on the road. Um, as well as Dimi, we also have Josh from Dugu and George Lawyers, who'll be running through some of the potential criminal implications of cyclist first vehicle incidents and some of the best courses of actions from a legal perspective to take when dealing with conflict on the road. And finally, we're really excited to have um, a community psychologist, Dr. Peter Strecker uh, from Community Stars with us today. Uh, Peter will be talking to us more about the psychological side of dealing with conflict and some of the best courses of action you can take to avoid conflict altogether. Uh, we'll try and keep the presentation to an hour um, it is a webinar format where you can ask questions via the Q&A section at the bottom, but we, uh, we can't hear any of you speak, but we'll be monitoring the questions as we go and we'll, we'll be make time at the end for a quick Q&A with, uh, with our panellists. So before I hand over to Dimi from Morris Blackburn to start us off uh, with some of the road law information, I just wanted to um, give a quick moment to Lee Turner, who's joining us. Uh, first of all, to say thank you for joining us, Lee, um, and thank you for being willing to talk about the incident that you had recently. And I'll just give you a couple of minutes to set the scene, if you don't mind. All right. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. I'll keep it short and sharp because most have seen the video, but it was just what, it's probably what happened before the video started, which is probably is untold, where it was just quiet day, beach road, where we all ride up, you know, every day riding two abreast in the bike lane, a car came screaming past, just about knocked me off, very, very close. We caught up to it at the lights or it slowed down. We had an altercation, screaming, yelling. Um, and then basically he was swerving into the bike lane at uh, myself and my friend. I went around him on the outside where he'd sort of stopped half in the bar bike lane, half parked, half on the road. We had another argument and then he reversed um, into me, dragged my bike and myself because my front wheel got caught in his uh, front wheel arch, dragged me backwards. And then once I stopped, I fell off my bike, grabbed my bike, put it against a car. And then that's when basically the video starts where I'm quite animated and um, screaming, carrying and yelling on because I'd lost my cool then, which I shouldn't have. And you know, he was telling me he was going to bash me and that's why I was jumping around like a kangaroo because I said to him to get out of the car and let's dance, which wasn't ideal, but I was quite um, frustrated and angry and everything else. And that's basically the video's arrest, which is everyone has uh, seen. 
Thanks, Lee. Uh, appreciate you being uh, so open and honest with us and for joining us. Um, I'll now oh, hand over to uh, Dimi from Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everyone. My name is Dimi Yuanu, and I'm a principal lawyer at Morris Blackburn. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, thank you all for attending here today. Uh, Morris Blackburn and Bicycle Network have a long-standing partnership, uh, which I have been heavily involved in. And I'm proud to say that this is, I believe, Nick, the third webinar we've put on this year. So if you are keen on hearing any specific topics, um, please email Nick or Anthony Elliott at Bicycle Network and we can roll out further webinars in 2022. Um, so in my presentation today, uh, next slide please, Nick. In my presentation today, I am going to talk about the new road rules amendments that make it safer for bicycle riders across the country. Um, as we're well aware, cyclists are a vulnerable road user group due to the limited physical protection uh, to them and therefore uh, require additional protective measures to be put in place. And therefore, uh, something needed to be done in order to improve cycling safety. A number of different external stakeholders got on board to advocate for cyclist safety and improving cycling infrastructure. For example, in February 2014, no Australian jurisdiction had minimum overtaking distance laws on and ma mandated. Um, and in April 2014, the Queensland government became the first in Australia to implement a minimum overtaking distance trial. And when this was implemented, recent Queensland figures showed that 70, drive, that 70 drivers had been charged under the new amendment rules. However, South Australia, our friends in South Australia, were the first state to mandate minimum overtaking distance rules to provide for a meetup matters without undertaking a trial. And in accordance with the Amy Gillett Foundation, South Australia surveyed the largest recreational cycling organisation and the following uh, key results were found, which I found very, very interesting. 74% said the amended road users engage them to ride on the road more often than before. 70% notice an improvement in the distance given by drivers in speed zones under 60 kilometres, and 78% notice drivers crossing the dividing line when overtaking as permitted by the amended road rules, which I found was very interesting. Um, our, our, and as of January 2016, five jurisdictions had implemented mandatory minimum overtaking distancing rules. And our friends in Northern Territory have also expressed an interest in looking at the new road rules amendments in the foreseeable future. Next slide, please, Nick. Education campaigns is essential to the effectiveness of law changes and each state have their own story to tell. Uh, in Queensland, they have the stay whiter of the rider. In Tasmania, they have the distance makes the difference. In South Australia, reminder, new cycling laws have taken effect. In ACT, safer cycling reforms and in New South Wales, go together. Uh, next slide, please. As we're all familiar, it is really important to raise public awareness and launching these education campaigns in order for us, A, to educate our community, but also to able to enforce and improve the cycling safety across the country. According to the Transport Accident Commission, figures show that between 2016 and 2020, serious accidents involving cyclists were on the rise. Um, and this was evident to me when I was, I was practicing as a TAC lawyer for almost 10 years. Uh, figures show that of the cyclists killed on Victorian roads, almost half of the fatalities involved vehicles traveling parallel to their bike. And to combat the increase of rider fatalities on Victorian roads, the Victorian government finally launched an inquiry in 2016. Next slide, please, Nick.
Submissions were made by the Amy Gillett Foundation, Cycling Victoria, and other cycling safety bodies. And a bill was finally introduced in 2015. And finally, in our home state, on the 26th of April, 2020, the Victorian government introduced the Road Safety Road Rules Amendment Rules 2021, requiring mandatory distancing laws for drivers to safely overtake cyclists on roads. Next slide, please. Now, the, the following amendment rules were introduced. A driver of a motor vehicle driving past the right-hand side of a bicycle must pass the bicycle and sufficient distance from the bicycle if the bicycle is traveling along a road in the same direction. Drivers and motorcyclists can briefly cr cross painted lines to give cyclists the space they need, solid lines, double lines, painted tram lines and painted islands but only when the driver can safely has a clear view of the approaching traffic. Next slide, please, Nick. But before I move on to this slide, it is really important to stipulate that there are different rules involving and there's different laws and compensation entitlements involved when you're involved in an accident, when there is another car involved. And also there are different rules because it falls under the public liability insurance when an, a cyclist has an accident involving a pedestrian, another cyclist, or for example, if the council was negligent and they failed to provide sufficient for sufficient lighting or failed to provide sufficient signs uh, um, or pavements marking warnings that cyclists about the dangers to different kinds of bike paths. Um, so please bear that in mind uh, that there are different laws and different rules that apply uh, if you've been injured on the road. Uh, as a result of the new amendment rules in April 2021, 20, the following distance must be maintained to ensure a safe overtaking of the 1.5 metre distance for cars exceeding 60 kilometres and the one metre distance for cars travelling below 60 kilometres. And, you know, we have to all continue to advocate together and spread the word to our community on how important it is to improve uh, the safety for cyclists uh, on the road because they are the most vulnerable as we have seen. Um, Lee is the perfect example of experiencing such a traumatic event. Um, so if we can do our part to prevent that from happening in the future, uh, we can all um, stick together and collaborate with, with Bicycle Network and with different other external stakeholders in order to achieve this. Thank you for uh, listening to my presentation today. Um, and that is all from me. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Dimi. I really appreciate your insight there as always. Um, now I'm gonna hand the floor over to Josh, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the potential criminal implications uh, of a cyclist versus vehicle incidents. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Dimi. Um, as a firm, we've acted for people on both sides of the, the, this conflict. Um, that is drivers who are charged with criminal offences for their conduct towards cyclists, and then also cyclists who have been charged for their behaviour towards other road users. Um, whatever else happens during a conflict, you want to make sure that you yourself don't wind up being charged with a criminal offence at the end of the day or being threatened by police um, with that outcome. Um, there are a number of potential charges that drivers can face if they're involved in um, incidents on the roads. There's a suite of outcome-based offences um, where a death is caused or serious injury is caused. Um, there are offences for um, endangering others, um, so reckless conduct endangering life or reckless conduct endangering serious injury. Um, one can imagine that driving whilst another person's on the bonnet of your car could potentially fit the category of reckless conduct endangering serious injury and then there are the um, basic driving offences of careless driving and, and dangerous driving which, which have all got different tests which are, apply to them which I won't um, necessarily bore everyone with because you're probably more interested in um, the, the position of cyclists. Um, there are Putting aside the driving offences where you're not in charge of a motor vehicle, there are numerous offences that anyone can commit during the course of a conflict, particularly if they've sort of lost their temper or lost control of themselves. Um, there's a, a few that spring uh, readily to mind. So it, it's an offence to threaten to kill someone, um, but there's also an offence of threatening to inflict serious injury. 
Um, there are injury offences for where you um, injure a person and cause a certain level of injury. And then there are basic assault charges. Um, and assaults can be committed in two different ways. Um, people typically think, well, I, if you don't touch a person, you, you, you haven't assaulted them. But an assault can be the deliberate application of force to another person, which can also be um, charged with uh, assault by causing someone else to fear the um, immediate application of force to them. And so you could threaten them with words and commit an assault or raising your fist or threatening a person um, could also be charged as an assault. And there's also an offence of <clears throat> criminal damage where you deliberately um, damage the property of another person. Um, now, none of those things are crimes if you are acting in self-defence. Um, and to act in self-defence, you can be acting in uh, defence of yourself or another person. Um, but <clears throat> the legislation defines self-defence to also include um, acting in the protection of property. Um, the, the test for self-defence has got a, a two components. It's, there's a subjective component and a sort of objective reasonableness component. So a person carries out conduct in self-defence if they themselves, this is a subjective component, believe that what, that, what they did or you know, what they're doing is necessary to do in self-defence. So they've got the subjective belief that it's necessary. And then the, there's the reasonable, the test that the conduct has got to be a reasonable response in the circumstances as the person um, perceives them. So there's the two, uh, two limbs to that. Um, if we can go to the, the next slide, Nick. Um, what to do at the uh, time of an incident? I'm stealing some of um, Dr. Peter's um, content here, but the best thing that you can do is keep as calm as you can and, and be on your own best behaviour. Um, incidents can escalate completely out of control uh, as the, the incident that brings us here today did. Um, but we all know from the news that um, other, other incidents that have spiralled out of control, you know, a single punch can kill a person if they fall and hit their head. And um, you, you will all know that the roadside is an inherently dangerous environment given the other vehicles and, and moving parts that exist in, in that situation. So the thing to do during an incident is um, try not to get up in, um, in front of people's faces, keep a safe distance from them and um, think about if it's possible even keeping your bike as a barrier between you and another person. Um, you never know um, who else might be filming or recording um, and in many different parts of the city, there's um, often a lot more CCTV than what you might expect. Um, at the end of the day, if there's a dispute about what's happened in an incident or you're, you're upset about bad driving behaviour, on the roadside immediately after it happened is not usually the best place to be dealing with it, um, especially if there's a dispute about an accident that, that, that's occurred. Um, during an incident, um, something that you can do is start recording as best you can what's happening. Film it if you can, um, but even making an audio recording can be useful to, to capture the detail of what's happened. Um, you know, if, if you feel that the situation might escalate, if you start waving your phone around and filming, you could use it to start an audio recording and it's still going to capture some of the detail of and the things that people say about what happened immediately afterwards can be highly probative in, a, in any potential um, court case. Um, ask the person or other people who are involved in any incident for their contact details. Um, if a driver won't provide their details, just take their registration. The police have got a power to uh, make a registered owner of a vehicle inform them who was in charge of a vehicle at a particular time if it wasn't them as the registered owner. Um, it's really not worth escalating a conflict in the moment in order to obtain the details of someone or to um, keep that person at the scene. You can leave that task um, up to the police. During an incident, call the police if you need to. Um, if we can go to the next slide, which is um, what to do afterwards. Um, I, I think in the immediate, I'm sort of combining some legal things with, with um, common sense, things that are perhaps bleedingly obvious to everyone, but what to do immediately afterwards is make sure you're okay, make sure you're safe and move off the road if you need to, and make sure that everyone's present and has seen what has happened is psychologically okay. Um, you know, these sort of incidents can, can be very confronting. Um, obtain the contact details of any potential witnesses to what's occurred. 
And if the police are on their way, ask witnesses to remain so that they can speak to police. We see it a lot in cases where, you know, there's a big crowd of people who've seen something and you, you wind up only with one or two um, witness statements because the, you know a couple of people who are interested are supporting the person who's left their stay and you've lost a whole lot of potential um, useful information about what really took place but with those who just walk away so ask people um, for their details um, and ask them to remain if they can um, if you notice other people recording what was happening obtain their details and ask for a copy of anything that they've recorded and make your own notes as soon as you can afterwards about what happened. Um, record all the events, what happened, um, take photos of the location and a video of the location. If you're out on a long ride and you don't have pen and paper with you, use your phone to record yourself talking as soon as possible afterwards about what happened and, and do a sort of recreation um, because then you, you leave yourself with the, the best possible record of events. Um, now, your, your rights when dealing with the police, um, if you're being accused of wrongdoing yourself, you've got this fundamental um, right to silence so, and a right to obtain legal advice before answering the questions of police. Um, and you can exercise that right by saying no comment. Um, something that's built into that is that um, if you're dealing with the police and you're not quite sure of your position, whether they're talking to you as a witness or talking to you as a, as a potential suspect, just ask them outright saying, well, are you, you know, in what capacity are you, are you speaking to me? Am I, am I being investigated? Am I suspected of anything? Um, if you were acting in self-defense or think that you might have been, um, you, you definitely want to get legal advice straight away before you take the decision whether you're going to answer questions in an interview or not. Um, it can be very useful in, in a case to get your side of the story on record as soon as possible, especially if you, you're saying something like um, that you're acting in self-defence. Um, if the police want you to make a witness statement, whether that's as a witness or as a complainant in a case, uh, it's important you know that you're not obliged to, to make a complaint, you're not obliged to make a statement if you don't want to, and you're entitled to take time to think about that if that's what you want to do. Um, and if you do make a statement, make sure you insist on reading it over and including everything that you think is important. Don't be guided um, by the police officer wanting to rush through it or saying, oh, that's not relevant or this is relevant. Um, insist on, on having recorded in that document everything that you think is important. Um, if you're um, involved in an incident where you're essentially the victim and your property was damaged, um, I'm imagining a very expensive bicycle that, that might've been ruined. If you find out that the police are going to charge a person with criminal damage or some other offence, you can ask them to apply for a compensation order as part of those proceedings um, under the Sentencing Act. And for instance, if you provide them with information about the, the expense or cost of the bike, police prosecutors can make an application for, for compensation in exactly that amount. Um, and then finally, the last slide is again, stealing Dr. Peter's um, um, some of his territory, but th this sort of incident can be very shocking and uh, disturbing. So make sure that you, you know, take care of yourself and take the necessary time to, to process it. And that may involve going and um, speaking to someone about it. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much, Josh. We really appreciate your, uh, your insight on that. Um, I'll, I'll now hand over to, uh, to Dr. Peter Strecker from Community Stars. Um, thanks very much, Nick, and thanks, Josh, for that, and Dimmy for that. Um, you didn't steal any thunder. I think our thunder's collective here. <laughs> um, I might steal some of yours now. Um, so, Nick, I might go to the first slide. Um, I thought I'd call my presentation Why I No Longer Give the Bird, which is um, sort of gives away the, the takeaway message um, right from the onset. My background is I've worked uh, in family violence for the last 25 years with thousands of um, violent men. And very early in the piece, one of the first things I learned was that, um, I might go to the next slide, Nick, if that's okay, was that in the groups, um, they all carried weapons. So uh, some of the men that I was working with who were involved in road rage incidents um, would talk to me about 
experiences they had. Some of them would chase other cyclists or other drivers for 20 or 30 minutes before they caught up with them and um, would pull out a weapon from under their seat and attack them, including, you know, stomping on their bonnet of their car and smashing their, every window in their car or that sort of thing. So um, when, I remember when one man told me about an incident like that, I asked every, everyone else in the group as to who else carried weapons and every single person uh, put their hand up. So they carried um, makeshift weapons like spanners and metal rods and back in those days would be searing columns and, uh, sorry, searing locks and clubs and bats and all sorts and knives and all sorts of things. So that's something to keep in the back of our mind in case we're tempted to um, retaliate. I might go to the next slide, Nick. Just wanted to make a very quick point on this. We often see um, headlines like the this one from the glorious Courier Mail in Queensland that um, this is a type of behaviour that moronic bogans um, commit and not, no one else. But in my experience, um, people across the socioeconomic um, spectrum can commit aggressive violent acts. So it's, if we think we only need to be fearful of the bloke in the ute, um, we've got another thing coming. There's all sorts of people who can re um, respond in violent and aggressive ways on the road, as no doubt many of you have attested to. Might go to the next one, please, Nick. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but these are the nine tr primary triggers of, that trigger violence. Um, if somebody is fearful of their life or limb, so they're feeling of fearing of getting hurt themselves. Um, if they feel insulted, if they're protecting their family or their environment, or they're trying to claim some environment, such as um, you know raiding another village, whatever. Um, Maging also triggers a lot of violence. We'll see that on King Street when all the pubs reopen again in the near future. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've got I the asterisk here. <laughs> um, and um, creating order in society, resources, tribal behaviour, and the last one's um, being trapped. So people will use violence to try to free themselves from being entrapped. Um, the ones that I've asterisked there are the ones that are most likely to happen in a road rage incident. If, if drivers are worried that they're going to get hurt themselves, if they feel insulted, um, if their car has been damaged, or if they feel like they, sh you know, don't deserve to share the road with you, you know, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, they're the primary ones. We can avoid trapping someone by not chasing after them and um, getting stuck into them. Although, as we we've heard already, it's easier said than done, and in the moment. It's, um, it's much more difficult to keep our calm, but I'll, I'll talk about how we can do that in a minute. I might go to the next one, please, and um, the next click too. So I just focus on the bottom four of these, um, these aspects of the spectrum of anger, but this slide just shows us that um, often anger can take very different forms from frustration through to violence. Um, so we'll focus on the, on the last four parts, which are the most um, aggressive parts that we'll be experiencing. If somebody's frustrated on the road, it's unlikely that they'll attack us, although sometimes that might happen. What defensive anger means is that um, sometimes people will get frustrated and they won't back down. So they'll start to become embarrassed that, they've, that they're causing a scene and they become really defensive. So that's what that, that means. And difficult argumentative people are people who are hyper cynical and critical and just argue over everything and won't, won't ever back down. We'll leave those people alone and we'll talk more about the, the bottom four through the rest of the session. Um, might go to the next one, please. You've probably all heard of the fight, flight, freeze response, which is the response that we get when we're in a very dangerous or life-threatening situation. Um, sometimes drivers will have this experience if we if they are shocked by something that we have done on our, on our bikes. Um, sometimes it doesn't take much at all to provoke this sort of response from someone. So we might have appeared out of nowhere and, and they've had to slam their brakes on and they might be you know, afraid of hurting us. Or um, we may have accidentally scratched their car or something like that. So if um, somebody flees or if they freeze, it's not going to make much difference to us, but it's the fighting aspect which uh, we'll be focusing on today. So... This is when somebody tries to manage that situation where they're, where they're afraid by trying to overpower the threat. Um, the, other, the other way is uh, fleeing, which means that they run away or they escape, and freezing can either mean that they try to hide or avoid attention or interest, which we may have done if we were 
on public transport, for example, and somebody's in a, in a rage on a tram or a bus or a train or something, and we just try to become as grey and um, invisible as possible so we don't attract that person's attention. So that's one way that we can respond to dangerous situations. And some people will collapse or faint under extreme shock as well. We won't focus on that one either. I might go to the next one. So one thing that, that's evident in the, um, our experience, yeah, we can put them all up if you like, Nick, um, is that we don't know what the other person has just been going through because for the most part, they'll be strangers to us. It's very unlikely that we'll get into a violent incident with somebody who's, who, we know that, who we know well. Um, so we don't know what's led up to that incident. This could be the last straw in a series of events that they've been going through through the day. Um, somebody might be late and rushing, so they might already be agitated and um, anxious before before they encounter us. There might be some earlier incident that they've just come from. They may have been sacked from work or they may have broken up a relationship or there's a whole range of things that could happen that could escalate somebody's mood before they encounter us. Um, some people may have a very hostile um, approach to cyclists. So remember another very quick story. I was uh, flying from Melbourne to Perth once and the bloke who was sitting next to me was a Polish cyclist who just ridden from Perth to Melbourne. And um, he said to me, what is it with Australian motorists? He said, when I got close to the border of Adelaide and Victoria and all the way through to Melbourne, um, motorists were tooting me and yelling abuse at me. And all I was doing was just riding my bike. And he said, you would never get that attitude in Europe. Um, so we're trying to explain why um, Australian motorists were, were hostile towards cyclists. Some people um, hold a superior attitude. They belong, they've got more rights on the road than we do. You know, we hear that, um, that old excuse that, you know, they pay registration and cyclists don't and all that, those sorts of arguments. And also in the work that I've done with violent men, we talk about anger being the second emotion, that often there's something else underneath the anger. The anger is the way, or the anger or the violence is the way that the emotion is expressed, but it may also be an expression of fear or anxiety or guilt or humiliation or shame or something like that. So sometimes we may have had the experience where somebody goes off their head for no apparent reason um, and we haven't done anything wrong ourselves, but it's it's more about what's going on inside them. It's more about their, them feeling humiliated or guilty or something in in public, and them not wanting to show any weakness publicly. So they they attack others as a way of reasserting authority over that situation. Then there's other influences such as you know psychosis and drugs and other aspects that could that could escalate people's emotions as well, which I won't go into in any detail, but. I can answer questions on that if you like later. Um, actually, before I do go off that point, one quick way of if somebody is psychotic, and this is um, this is very rare, but it but it can happen. One of the main um, techniques to use is to focus on the person's feelings. So, for example, if somebody believes that there are aliens crawling inside their walls in their house, it doesn't matter whether that belief is real or not. What it, it what matters is the experience that they're having emotionally. So one way of helping people calm down in those situations is to focus on their emotions. So saying something like that must feel really terrifying for you is a way of de-escalating that situation. That, that final comment on the page, we're not disrupting the traffic. We are the traffic was a um, sticker that one of my friends used to have on her bike um, that would help validate her position on the road as a, as a um, road user rather than someone who is interrupting the traffic I might go to the next one so the crux of all of this is what can we do to live and ride another day um first point there is that we're likely to also have a fight flight freeze response so and in as other speakers have said already um cyclists are much more vulnerable physically on the road than than people in cars you know we could be much more easily killed on the road so if we possibly can if we we do have that fight, flight, freeze response to the threat. If we can hold on for 30 seconds to three minutes and just not say anything or not do anything that's going to make the situation worse. This is what we teach people um, in 
men's behaviour change groups who are violent on the roads. In 30 seconds, that threat will be gone or three minutes, that, you know, that threat will be gone and you'll never see that person ever again. But if you stay around and you get into a confrontation with them, then that threat or that problem is going to be in your life for a lot longer. So we're assuming, of course, that there hasn't been a collision, which, you know, means that you'll have to be, be around for longer than three minutes. Um, second point is don't expect reason to work. Uh, if people are in a highly escalated position, they're very unlikely to listen to reason. So what we want to do instead is try to reduce our, our presence of being a threat to them through our actions and our words. So one way of doing that is to just ignore any bait or any offensive comments and don't argue with the person. That's, again, that's easier said than done. Um, many people will instinctively want to get into an argument or particularly if we are if we do genuinely believe that we're in the right and the other person's being irrational um but at this point in time it's not going to help so as josh was saying before if we can be as calm and cool and collected as we possibly can even if we've just gone through an extreme extremely dangerous circumstance um that puts us in a stronger position one of the quickest ways of de-escalating someone is to validate their feelings, which doesn't mean that we agree with them, but we might say something like, oh, you know, um, I can see that you're really angry right now, or I can see, see that um, you're really frustrated right now, or something like that. And that helps people lower down that notch. So what we're looking for if people are starting to de-escalate is um, physical signs such as them dropping their shoulders or sighing or saying something back to us in response that acknowledges that we acknowledge what they're going through. Again, at this stage, we're not there to win an argument or we're not there to prove that we're right. We're just there to try to de-escalate the situation so that we've only got one problem instead of two. Um, another strategy is to focus on the future if possible, like saying, making a comment like, look, I'm sure we've both got better things to go to than, than to hang around here having an argument about who was right and who was wrong. And, Try to move the um, move the conversation away from the the point of argument to something into the future where someone can go. Ideally, we want that we want that person who's being aggressive towards us to disappear from our life and and go. Um, as Josh said before, if you are in a situation where you are about to be attacked or you are being attacked, try to be aware of the space that you're in. Don't find yourself in a boxed in position if as much as possible and use barriers to protect yourself. It might be a lamp pole or a traffic light or a fence or a wall or something like that, which, uh, which you can use to protect yourself, or it might be your bike. So putting your bike up so that someone doesn't um, thrash at you with a, with a sword or, or a knife is a useful idea. Um, try to find escape routes for yourself. If situations do escalate to that point, and also enable them to escape. Don't trap them and don't box them in. Um, if we, when I do the talks like this, you know, say a reception room, we always look for making sure that the person who's being aggressive has a way to save face and to disappear. Um, we don't want to block the doorways for them. So in this situation, we want them to enable, uh, we don't want to stand in the way between them and their car. We want them to be able to get to their car and go away. Um, as Josh said before, also, um, try to gather as many witnesses as possible. Um, you might use your phone to either audio or video record it. Some people have helmet cameras. Um, you might want to get names of bystanders or neighbours or people who have seen that. And the other thing is try to keep your eyes on people if possible. So don't turn your back on them because that also can give them opportunity if they do want to physically assault you to do that. Uh, and um, did I mention that they all carry weapons? So my last slide, please, Josh. Uh, sorry, uh, not Josh. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> all right. So just, uh, sorry, I've got one more slide of this. I just remembered to put an extra one in. So very quickly, we know that this can be a very distressing situation, especially if it's life-threatening. Um, try to talk to people if you can. Most people can manage these situations by themselves with their own resources, with their own friends and family and resources that are around them. Um, again, I won't steal um, Josh's point here about collecting evidence. So if, if you plan to take legal action, collect as much evidence as you can. And Josh covered that uh, really well. Um, it's important to understand the impact of shocking events, particularly life-threatening events, if you've nearly been killed or if you've been run off the road. 
um, your body and your brain will respond in very predictable ways um, to try to make sense of what's gone on and to try to process that traumatic experience. Um, some of these things may include being unable to sleep, being agitated and edgy, um, breaking down into tears randomly. So what we're looking for is, is whether those changes um, happen for less than a month or more than a month. That's the, the key time frame. So we want to try to look for changes to your lifestyle and seek professional help if you need extra support. As I said earlier, most people can manage by themselves, but it's, it's important to seek extra support if you need to. And sorry, now my final slide is just some, some of the symptoms to look out for for, this, for an experience called post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are the four indicators to look for. If, you, if after a month you're constantly reliving the traumatic event and you're having things like nightmares and flashbacks and panic attacks about the experience, um, you might need some support there. If you're chronically agitated or wound up all the time, you can't sleep, you're always on edge or you're easily startled and easily shocked, that's another warning sign to look out for. If you're finding yourself um, experiencing avoiding behaviour, so you're avoiding people and activities and places and feelings and thoughts associated with the event, that's another you know, warning sign. And the last one is feeling emotionally numb. So just feeling completely numb and cut off and not yourself. So if you have these experiences for more than a month, um, it, you may have experienced post-traumatic stress disorder. It, it doesn't always come out in this nice, neat way. It, you know, people experience it differently. Um, that's not to say you might, that you might not get some professional help before the month is through, um, but these are some of the, the big things to look out for. So I might end it there. Thank you very much, Peter. I really appreciate um, your uh, psychological perspective there. I think it's really important. Um, we're gonna open up the floor now to a few questions. Um, we've have some that have come through that I can, um, that I might just address to our, to our panelists now, if that's okay. So uh, one of the questions that came through um, that I think uh, when you were talking, Dimmy, was, a question that says, are riders on shoulders covered by the minimum passing distance laws? And does there have to be an actual parking restriction sign applying to the stretch of shouldered road for riders to be covered? That's a really good question. Um, uh, my understanding is that riding the shoulder and using the shoulder as a lane is frustrating for all. And if it's not used for an emergency or for a highway vehicle, it is illegal. And if you are caught, you could be issued with an infringement notice. But as it stands, there isn't no current signs available at the moment. Um, and that's one thing that we are going to have to look at. While I've got you, Dimmy, another one just came through. Notice response speaking on that one. Um, Josh? The, yeah, the, the road rules define sort of roads and road related areas where road rules apply pretty broadly. Without having it in front of me, I would suspect that the the way the rules treat it is that, it, you know, any place where a vehicle and cyclist are there together, they've got to, to give that that distance. So that the minute that you know the minimum passing distance applies on any road or road related area, including shoulders and other parts of the road. Thank you, Josh, and thanks, Dimmy. Um, another one just came through uh, for you, Dimmy, that says, "If I'm hit while road cycling by a car and injured, what step do I need to take? Do I contact the TAC first, or you, or Bicycle Network?" Uh, no, that's a gr another great question. Um, my, yes, definitely. The first step is to lodge a TAC claim because you only have 12 months to lodge a claim from the date of the accident. And the one thing that Josh mentioned earlier is that please always, if the driver stops, take down their details. If there's any witnesses, collect their information, um, take photos of the accident scene, but also uh, if you need to go to hospital because you've been injured, obviously that is, that is your priority. Uh, but the one thing is um, please ensure and be mindful that bicycle accident law is complicated and each state and territory has its own laws that apply uh, to, to, to to compensation, whether it is for TAC claims or 
public liability claims. But the other thing you need to be mindful of is that you have only six years to make a claim. But yes, you can call Morris Blackburn and we offer a first uh, initial consultation, which is for free, that we can discuss all your entitlements um, and explain the whole TAC journey with you. Thanks, Dimi. Um, we had a question uh, that came through while you were talking, Josh. Um, somebody asked if there are any legal implications associated with filming someone on your phone in public? Yeah, not, not whilst you're in public. So there are some, um, you know, Surveillance Devices Act um, offences for capturing private activities, but no, in public, I mean, you, can, you can record a conversation that you're a part of and you can, um, you know, film what's going on in public. Following that, I actually had a question um, for you, uh, Peter, um, regarding the, the filming things, uh, something that popped to my mind is that I fear that um, filming something might increase the confrontation in some instances, not that I've had the experience myself, but it's something that um, that I would be concerned about if pulling out my phone might actually aggravate the situation. So I was wondering if you could have, you've had any advice around that perhaps. Um, yeah, the joy about psychology is that no two humans are the same and that what will be the best thing for some person will be the worst thing for another. So some, you're absolutely right. Some people will be aggravated and I'll see that as more threatening. Um, some people, it may be a deterrent and they'll go back and they'll, they won't want to get filmed and they'll, they'll run away from the, from the prospect of being filmed. But I'd caution against it because it will definitely, if somebody's um, in full flight, it, it's likely to aggravate them. And we, we see, you know, video after video from the US of aggressive people being filmed. Um, and sometimes they attack the person with the camera and sometimes they, they disappear. So it, there's varying responses, but I'd be cautious about that if, you, um, if you're worried about being, being threatened or if somebody does yell at you to put the camera away, then I would do that because that, they obviously see they seeing that as a threat. That's good advice. Thanks, Peter. Um, a question came through uh, for you, Lee, uh, which was just, if you had one key takeaway, what would you advise? <clears throat> Uh, probably keep your cool. Like it, I know it's easier said than done, but honestly, if we had just when we caught up to the light, said nothing, and then rode, you know, nothing would have happened. But I guess it's as um, Josh or someone said before, it's easier said than done. Like because being a cyclist, every every day there's an incident. Honestly, every day there's a near miss or an incident. You and your fuse or your, uh, is so short, so you do tend to go off quite quickly because what I haven't even said is before that incident, we were close past 10 minutes earlier, so you're just already on high alert, so you just sometimes just got to zip it and shut up and forget about it. It's honestly the best advice, but it is hard to do. Thanks for that, Lee. And uh, we just had one last question that came through uh, in the Q&A section, um, which I think is important to address. Um, somebody said, I find the roads are becoming a scary place to be, sadly. I'm curious to know what BN are doing to educate drivers. It seems the responsibility is falling on cyclists. Drivers don't seem to know or care about the road rules applicable to cyclists uh, and, and O for the European outlook. And I think it is a good point which is, uh, to address. Um, Bicycle Network certainly is, um, and we don't want to, put the onus on cyclists all the time to, uh, to, to, to pick up the slack. Um, it is important for all road users to, um, to do their part here. And um, Bicycle Network certainly works with a lot of the other um, partners with Vic Roads, with TAC to, to I guess, um, the key message here, I think, is to try and um, diminish the, the us versus them mentality and, um, and we always try and do that as much as possible. And, and it's funny in the comment, oh, for the European outlook, which is something that a lot of bike riders sort of um, lament on. Uh, it, this doesn't happen in Europe. It was mentioned in one of the presentations. And it's something that we, as, as an organisation, uh, we're obviously trying to emulate that, um, that approach. And one of the reasons why well, we find that the European outlook is so 
it seem, seems to be um, a more friendly place for all road users is because there seems to be more of an understanding there that bike riders are car drivers and car drivers are bike riders. And I think that's a really important um, point to end on. And it's important for when, um, when you are in the, obviously people here are bike riders. So we can relate when we're on the road to know when we're, dri when we're driving a vehicle to know how a cyclist might feel. But uh, in some, I guess, the key message here is not everybody in a car can really empathize sometimes with people on a bike. So, I mean, one of the, our key missions at Bicycle Network is to get more people riding so that uh, we can start to foster that sort of uh, that environment on our roads. But we're certainly trying to diminish the, um, the us versus them mentality as much as possible. Um, so that was all the questions that we had. Um, I just wanted to finish up with a quick thank you again. Um, a big thank you to Lee for joining us and for being so open and honest about your experience. We really appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much to Dimmy, Josh and Peter for your expertise and for your time tonight to run us through uh, those different areas about dealing with conflict while on the road. Um, as we mentioned at the start, the webinar will be filmed and put up on the website. And um, if you have any follow-up questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to us at our membership at bicyclenetwork.com.au. But otherwise, a big thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I hope that it was helpful and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Good night.